idea, man. I'm, I'm stoked. I think that's a word we can still use, right? Every once in a while, words kind of come in vogue and then they go back out. I think stoked still applies. Man, I am so excited about this message. I sent out the outline. Please, if you've got your bulletin with you, pull it out. Follow along with the outline and it'll make you remember so much more. Um, I know in school how you have to take notes and there's a reason for that. Because not only do you hear what's happening, you see it when you write it down and you have to think about it to write it. So it's just another tool to remember. And um, I want this to change your life today. I'm dealing with uh, the movies. We're still in at the movie series. And um, how many of y'all enjoyed this so far? Anybody enjoying that the movie series? I know I do it a little bit different. Some churches like show clips and all kinds of stuff of theology. I kind of like to give the premise, kind of the big point overview of, of what a movie was about. And, um, and, and then kind of expound on where I find that in the scriptures. And today is, is one of those days. We're dealing with the movie called The Vault in Our Stars. And the Vault in Our Stars, I want to give you just a brief kind of overview on, on kind of the main point that I want to draw out of the film. The film is about a young man and a young woman. Her name is Hazel, and she finds out that she has cancer, and it uh, metastasizes and gets bigger and goes into her lungs and starts spreading through her body, and she has very, uh, very small prognosis on the rest of her life. And in one of the support groups for people that have cancer, she meets a young man named Augustus, and the two of them kind of fall in love and, and on each other. And, and Augustus, he had cancer, it was in his leg, it caused his leg. Uh, to be amputated, but they, they kind of have this true young love that comes about from meeting, and here's basically what they decide, and here's the point I want to draw from it. Nothing that's happening in this life or has happened will stop me from enjoying where I'm at. In other words, it's easy to sit back and look at the position you're in and kind of get down on yourself and think, I don't want to see people. I don't want to do anything because my life is just not in a good place right now. How many of us think about this? I don't want to raise your hands. But how many of us in life, when times get tough and things get hard, we want to draw kind of into a shell and get away and kind of like stop our life? Think about it. Isn't that how it is? Man, you get bad news about something, you don't want to go to a Hickory Crawdads game after that. You want to go home and sit on your couch and think about it, right? There's something about you kind of, for some reason, man's nature is when bad news comes or something bad can happen, we kind of want to just shut down in life. But here is two people in this movie who decided life may be bad. Bad things may be happening, things I can't control may have come about in my life, but I'm not going to let the circumstances I'm in dictate the way I live my life. That's a pretty powerful example when you think about it. Nothing that has happened, will happen, or could happen to me is going to change how I'm going to approach and live my life. Think about it this morning. Here's kind of what I'm, what I'm drawing on this morning. What is there in your life that makes you think you can't live it to its fullest? Think about it this morning. What is there in life that makes you think you can't live life to its fullest? Ephesians chapter number 2 is where I'm going to draw my text verse. Ephesians chapter number 2. If you have your Bible, which I recommend, iPad, iPhone, whatever it takes, um, Go there, Ephesians chapter 2, 10. Actually, if you want to just go to the book of Exodus, chapters 2, 3, and 4, that's probably better because Ephesians 2, 10 is in your bulletin with the verse and you can read along with me. So if you have your Bibles, go to Exodus chapter 2, 3, and 4, and that's where we're going to pull out the message this morning. But Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 10 says this, and listen, I want you to understand, there are no qualifications listed on this verse. This verse in Ephesians 2.10 is for you. Scars, struggles, problems, good times, <laughs> all of it all together, it's for you. Ephesians chapter 2 verse number 10 says this. For we, that's me, that's you, are his workmanship. We are Jesus. There's another word for that and it's called masterpiece. We are his a masterpiece. I know we've got Rich here who loves to paint. He can tell you a lot about painting. And a masterpiece isn't just any painting that you do. A masterpiece is special. 
I mean, I look, read sometimes in the news and, and I, in the newspaper and, and online, and I see these paintings that are going for millions upon millions of dollars. There's Picassos, and there's Warhols, and there's other people, I don't know how to pronounce their names, and they have all of these paintings that are that I don't get. I look at, what's the one, Scream? Yeah. I, listen, Scream is a movie to me, okay? It's not a painting. First time I heard Scream was selling for millions, I'm like, a movie? You get that at Blockbuster. Well, not now, because Blockbuster's out. But let's Scream, and I don't get the painting just for me, for me. I, I don't have a trained eye. And it goes for millions. You know why? Because the beauty may not always be in the way that I see it. The beauty is in the way that the creator, come on now, you got to help me. The beauty is in the way that the creator made that masterpiece. Help me out this morning, church. We're going somewhere. So it's not always what I can see that makes something powerful and good. It's what the master who created that masterpiece sees. And here's what it says. For we, us, are God's masterpiece. How you are doesn't disqualify. We're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them, in those good works that God created for us. We are a masterpiece of God exactly as we are. We are created with a purpose. We may even endure the things we've endured for a purpose. That's the hard thing to look at. I sometimes say, you don't know the bad stuff that's happened in my life. I made some horrible decisions or other people have made bad decisions in my life. Listen, there is a purpose behind every bit of pain you've been in. The, the, the reality is and the hard thing is to sometimes look at it through what God and his masterpiece wants to see and not the way that I look at what's written on the canvas for me. So I'm talking this morning on the fault in our stars. And let's look at it this way. God says I'm a masterpiece and I'm created in His image. But why do I have so many problems? Think about it. If I'm a masterpiece created in God's image, why does my life have issues? Why does it seem like things have fallen apart? Why did I get the hand I'm dealt? Why am I in the position I'm in if I'm God? And I want to look at this in Exodus chapter number 2, 3, and 4 and show you the life of a man named Moses who from the beginning of his birth until the end of time of his death had so many faults and flaws. And here's the key. To get our eyes off of the faults that we feel like we have and get our eyes on the master who created the masterpiece that we are. Can we do that this morning? I want to pray. Then we'll dive into the message. Lord, I love you so much. And what I'm going to speak, I pray, life is given to someone this morning. May they walk out of here with a renewed understanding that their life counts for you. It's in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. So this morning I'm dealing with the fault in our stars. How many of y'all this morning, no raise of hand, think about it in yourself. Think about it in your life. How many of y'all sit here right now and say, I've got bad issues that keep me from being what God would really want me to be? Don't raise your hand. That's what you think about it. How many of y'all would say that about yourself? And if that's you, think it through and in your head say, that's me he's talking about. I've got problems and it's keeping me from being the potential that God wants me to be. In other words, the fault that I have, the way I see it, is worth more than the masterpiece that God created me to be. We have this guy named Moses that comes about in Exodus chapter number 2. Moses' life was crazy. He was born into a time in Egypt where the children of Israel, which was the tribe he was born into, was the, he was into the children of Israel, into, into um, the Israelites at the time. They, they were in bondage. Now get this. They hadn't been in bondage for just like a couple years. Okay? We're talking 400 years of bondage. In other words, they had generation after generation after generation and all those generations knew, John, is bondage. They were born, raised, and died and never knew freedom. And you say, how long is 400 years? Think about it this way. America, God bless America, right? It's America. God say America anymore. It's not even America. God bless America. America's only been here and actually been established since, what, 1776, right? 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 Do you realize that that is only about 204, I think it's 
240 plus years that America has been around? Now, America has been here 240 years. The Israelites have been slaves to the Egyptians for 400 years. Not only had there been Israelites who were born, raised, grew up, and died in bondage, there had been leaders and rulers that had grown up and died and never knew Israelites to be free, and all they knew was they had a mass number of servants for anything that they wanted as slaves. And all of a sudden, this little boy named Moses was born, but he wasn't just born into just the normal circumstance. He was born at a time where there was a decree out that if a, a baby child was born of the Israelites that was a male, it was to be slaughtered and killed immediately. Born into a world that doesn't know anything about, with its only hope being death. That's what Moses was born into. The problem was God had a greater plan for Moses. And Moses' mother carried him, concealed it, had a baby, but she knew she could not keep it. So many of us know the story if we've been in, in, into like uh, children's church or grew up in some Sunday school. We know that Moses' mother made a little ark. It's just like a little bassinet, basically, of bulrushes and, and reeds and, and sent Moses out into the Nile River and sent his older sister Miriam, who of course, because she was a female, was not killed, sent her to watch over the little boat to see what would become of it. Now you got to realize, the Nile River is not just a little bitty tributary that's about as wide as half this church. The Nile River is a massive flowing river filled with crocodiles and all kinds of stuff that just wants to eat you. And yet she said the only way of salvation is to trust that something will come of this. And the Bible said that Pharaoh's daughter came down to wash herself in the river, heard a baby crying, went out into the reeds and found the little ark and found the little boy and took him into the palace. And Miriam stopped her, Moses' little sister. And she, she's like, you got the baby? And, and they talked for a minute. And she's like, yeah, but I don't have anywhere to nurse him. And, and Mary says, well, I know a lady who, who just gave birth and didn't say who it was or, or what happened. And I'm assuming Pharaoh's daughter probably thought she gave birth to a boy and it was one of the ones that was killed. She's like, I know a lady who just gave birth. She'd be glad to nurse the baby for you. And Pharaoh's daughter's like, perfect. That's awesome. Go bring her in. And they brought Moses' mother to nurse Moses. What an amazing story and powerful so Moses has this crazy kind of start in life. Moses grows up and he becomes just like a normal guy. He has not been called, he has not been chosen at this point to be the deliverer of Israel like he would become. He grows up and he commits an awful sin that we're going to talk about in a little bit. And he goes off and runs off and basically banishes himself out to the, the backside of a far country. So here was a guy who was born into death, should have been dead, given this miraculous, provident way of coming to life through Pharaoh. After he was weaned off his mom, he grew up in the courts of Pharaoh and was given everything he wanted, just like she was his son. The whole time he's a little Israelite baby. And he grows up, commits an awful sin, and he's on the backside of the desert. And that's where I kind of want to stop for a second and then rewind back. I give you kind of that, that opening to show, show you a couple different things. We're going to talk about Moses' life, but I want you to understand several different things. We're going to start with point number one, and I'm going to walk you through why what I set up was intentional and purposeful for your life this morning. Number one, here's what I want you to write down. In Exodus chapter number 2, verse number 1 through 10, you can read it at home, but it's this. Your path to this point is not an accident. The fact that Moses gets out to this one spot after reading his story is only by the very hand and grace of God Almighty that got him to be the deliverer of all the children of Israel. Think about it. He's supposed to be dead. How many of y'all sitting here this morning, if you go back over your life, think back to maybe when you were young, think back to a time in your life when you look back and say, I should have been dead. 
There's, there should be no hope for me. If you'd have seen the wicked lifestyle and the way I live and all of the things that I've done, I should not be here. There is no way I should be sitting here alive on a Sunday morning. I should have died 30 years ago. Some of you have stories where you should have been dead on the table at the hospital. But yet you're here listening on a Sunday morning to a message about a movie. Why? I'll tell you exactly why. It's not an accident that you made it through the way you made it through this movie. If you are breathing, God still has a divine purpose for you upon this earth. Because if he does not have a purpose for you on this earth, you will be gone from this earth today. But the fact you're breathing and the fact you're listening to the word of God means God's not through with you yet. The path to this point is not an accident. See, it's easy to classify things as accidents if we don't believe what the Bible says in Romans chapter number 8, verse number 28. That's an easy verse to claim when everything is going good. And the verse basically, it just says this in a nutshell. If we know that all things work together for good, to those that love God, to those that are the called according to his purpose. Now listen, when my life is going well, that verse is great. I want it on my wall. Because it just looks pretty and sounds good. But let your life take a bad point. Let your life take a turn and something happens that you're like, I don't know what to do with this. This is bad. And then try quoting that verse and see if you really believe it. But if you believe that, we're all things. And that word all, I'm not an English major. I wasn't really good in English. I say America. That shows you I'm not great in English, right? I'm not an English major, but that word all means one thing. It's this. All. Now, if I said all of the people here today, thank you for being here, I don't mean, oh, everybody but Chris. If I wanted that, I would say everybody but Chris. Good to see y'all here today, right? But if I say all, that's a general to every single person that is inside of this building today. And Jesus says every single thing. There's not an exception. There's not something that we cancel out. There's not something to say, well, that's a different story. No, Chuck, all things work together for good. And if you believe that, you can look at your life and say, this bad thing has happened. This bad thing has happened. I don't understand why that was in my life. God, the burdens I have to carry off of that. I should have been dead. But you know what? You know why all that happened? Because God's going to get glory out of it somewhere in my life. And he still has a plan for me in spite of all of this. The path to this point is never an accident. God had his divine hand on Moses, guiding everything from his birth all the way up to pushing that little ark right up by Pharaoh's daughter to having Pharaoh be trained in the Egyptian schools where he knew how to speak to the Egyptians and knew their lifestyle and knew enough about their language to be able to be the deliverer one day. All of that's not an accident. It was planned by God. Number two, think about this. In Exodus chapter number 2, verse number 12 through 14, we find out that Moses gets a little bit older. He's, he's an older gentleman now, older man. I say older, but I'm probably my age. <laughs> he's not old, but older. He's not a teen. Put it that way. And he goes out and he sees a man mistreating and beating one of his fellow Israelites. And his rage, anger. We know he had anger issues. Greg, he had problems with his anger. He had anger issues, and, and he saw it, and the Bible says this. This is classic right here, right? The Bible says he looked to the right, and he looked to the left, and saw no man, so then he killed him. Boy, isn't that classic right there? I'm going to look this way. I don't see anybody, right? A premeditated murder right there. Guilty as charged, number one, by the jury. He knew what he was doing. And he slew the man who was beating his fellow Israelite. So Moses was now murdered. Here's a man that was destined to design by God. His pathway to the point of becoming the deliverer wasn't an accident. It was all orchestrated by God to use him. And now he's a murderer. 
And he thinks nobody saw it. And the Bible said that he dug up the sand and hid the body. He was like a cat in kitty litter. Just created a little hole in the sand and was like, get him covered. I don't think he did it with his foot, but he might have. And he covered up what he thought was his sin and then nobody saw him. And then a couple of days later, there was kind of a spat with some other men. And, and in the midst of it, one of them pipes up and be like, well, if, if you're going to fight, or you're not going to kill us like you did that Egyptian, are you? And whoa! All of a sudden he realized his sin had been found out. Somebody had been watching, peeking out from a corner somewhere. And now this man that's called by God to be the deliverer is a murderer. Because he knew people found out what had happened, he runs to the backside. He runs to the base of the backside of the desert, leaves everyone, flees. And he goes to watch, become a little shepherd. Which was, by the way, in the Bible, you'll find out it was just a menial, the lowest of the low tasks. A lot of times that was where people who had criminal records and could get no other jobs, they would go and become a shepherd. He goes and takes the worst of the lowest jobs out on the backside of nowhere because he's a murderer. Think about it this morning. Maybe you're today, you're sitting here, and you may not be a murderer. You may not be somebody who's done this one horrific, horrible deed in life. Or maybe you are sitting here, and there is that one sin that's always hard for you to forgive yourself for. As I've been speaking just in these last 30 seconds, your mind has automatically gone to that place and said, that's what he's talking about in my life right there. That particular place. And here's what it is. Here's what I want you to write down number two, though. You've got to realize, he became the deliverer. Number two, past sin does not prohibit service. Past sin does not prohibit service. It's amazing as a pastor, I get to speak to many people. And um, I have people come to me in confidence all the time with things in their life. And I would never reveal those out to other people, those are burdens that they carry that I will carry for them and with them. And I hear all the time, though, the number one thing is you don't understand how bad it is. You don't understand the way that I felt about it. You don't understand where my life is because of it. You don't understand what I've gone through because I made this awful choice. If you understood the fault that I had, you would not see the potential that you say God has for me. And we get so enamored. Because we're human, I get it. We get so enamored with us that we forget Him. Listen, Ephesians chapter number 2, he did not say that we're his workmanship if we have a laundry list of things that we've never done. See, because if that was the case, God is sinless and any sin is going to put us at odds and enmity with God. So therefore, it doesn't matter how you classify it. If there was a list of stipulations, none of us here this morning would ever fall on the right side of that verse. And that's why God gave us this subject called grace because it's through grace He sees us in Him and not who we were. Amen. Past sin does not prohibit servant. Moses was very quick later on, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, as he comes back to Pharaoh, was very quick to think that because of my issues in my life, because of my problems, because of my past, because of the mistake that I made, that mistake, I can't do what God wants me to do. I am a murderer. If you had to take your mistake this morning and put it on a wall, and it said, I am a whatever, do you believe that? Whatever on that blank is greater than God's forgiveness. If you do this morning, it's going to be hard to understand who you can be in Christ today. But if you look at that and say, if God's forgiveness can overshadow whatever I fill into the blank, why do I then have to say I've been forgiven but I cannot be used? Because no longer are we, I am a, in Moses' case, a murderer. 
They got X'd out. And God said, I am a Moses. You're no longer a murderer. I am a child of the king. And when I say child of the king, that past sin doesn't prohibit me from serving future tense. Past sin is not really service. Number three. Exodus chapter number four, verse number ten. I want to read this verse to you and then kind of talk about it. Because this is the part about Moses I haven't discussed yet. And he's going to wrap up in just a minute. In Exodus chapter number 4, verse number 10. Now, get this. We're going to learn more about this in point 4. But in point 3, understand this. God has already told Moses, you're going to go back and be the deliverer of the children of Israel. You're going to go speak to Pharaoh. You're going to be the mouthpiece for me to all of the children of Israel. You are going to become the de facto leader. I am using you. Your past sin does not prohibit your service. Your path to this point, it is for a purpose. It's not an accident. And he says this when he's told this. Exodus chapter number 40, verse number 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O Lord, I am not eloquent. <laughs> Sounds like he's from Burke County. I am not eloquent. Yeah, we got the McDowell County man. He's laughing at us over here. <laughs> um, Neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. But I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. In other words, he says, Lord, I'm not a polished speaker. And a matter of fact, what this means in that time period, put it in context, was Moses had a speech impediment and a stutter. Because to be a slow speech meant it would take a while to get out. And he says specifically, he is slow speech and a slow tongue. And he says, I'm not eloquent. In other words, I have no oratory skills. I want to stand in the back. I, I have some physical limitations that keep me from doing, God, what you have asked of me. How often do we look at what we can't do physically in this life and try to apply that to a spiritual nature? And because we can't do one thing the way we think we should, we do this. We cancel out and do nothing. I'll give you a great example. I'll give you a perfect example. Not everybody in this building today is gifted in the area of music. Now, there are some people who are very gifted. There are some people, I've stood in front of you while we've sang in the auditorium. God bless you, but you're not gifted either. There's things that I cannot do. There's a lot of things that some of you can't. But let's go back to music for a second. Here's the thing, though. I've actually had people come up to me, and they're like, Pastor Paul, man, I, I want to serve in the church. I want to do something. I'm like, okay. It's like, let's, let's figure out what you can fit into. Where you, and they're like, well, man, I love to sing, but I, I can't sing. Like, okay. But like, we know we can't sing, so I would never, you know, never do that. But I, can't, I wish I could be in the worship band. Okay. You said you can't do that. That's cool. What is it you can do? I don't know. There's nothing else I can do. But you, you told me you want to do something, then you tell me what you couldn't do, and now you say there's nothing else to do. What are you talking about? And here's basically what they're trying to say in a very nice way. If I could be up on the stage or if I could play and sing, I would do that. But because I can't, there's nothing for me to do. That's what they're saying. And so they've taken this approach of Moses, who we God said you could go lead my people out, Instead of saying, God, I can do it, and I've got an issue, but, um, but you know what? There's other things for me to do. There's other ways to approach it. He stops and says, no, God, I've got to stop right here. I'm going to draw the line. I'm not the greatest speaker. Well, guess what? God didn't ask him to be the greatest speaker. God didn't call you to be the greatest singer. God didn't call you maybe to be the greatest player. I don't know what your gift is. But the problem was, he took his one limitation that he did have, and he tried to use that as the excuse of, well, I can't do that, so therefore God can't use me. Instead of finding out exactly the vein God wanted him. Point number three is this. Limitations are excuses in disguise. Come on, help me out. Limitations are excuses in disguise. You're taking the one thing that you don't do well and you're saying now, I don't, I can't do anything else because of it. The limitations are excuses in disguise. How many of us today, how many of us today when we were in high school or we were in grade school or some kind of school, we had something in school that we were not good at? Here we go. 
All of us had at least one thing, right? There are some people that aren't great mathematicians. I'm one of them. Math was not my strong suit. There are some people who, they have trouble remembering anything. We have those, right? We have other people who, just English and conjunctions and transitive and intransitive verbs and uh, all these different nouns of direct address and prepositions and all this just absolutely takes you out into the far blue yonder. <laughs> That's me again. I'm not good at it. I like crazy words sometimes that people go through. They're like, you use the word in church thing I have never heard in my life. I'm like, I like those because I don't know real good ones I'm supposed to know. So I memorize some good, good long ones that stump y'all. But here's the thing. Let me ask you a question. Because you weren't good at math, let's use that one as an example. Because you were not good at math and it wasn't your best strong suit, did you refuse to graduate? Did you walk up on the platform and say, time out, hold up, hold up, time, oop, oop. I made A's and everything, but I got a B in math. I can't graduate. Anybody do that? No? Exactly. You know why? Because, yes, you're, you may have a limitation in one area, but you realize that one limitation doesn't affect the whole, and it should not affect. But why is it when God calls us into something, all of a sudden we start looking at what we are possibly limited in? Because let's be honest, although we're all masterpieces, every masterpiece is different. Some of us are talented in each individual way. That's just honestly, it's just there. Instead of looking at that and finding your talent, we focus on the limitation and the one problem that we maybe do have. And we say, God, that right there is bigger than what you want me to be. And here's all that is. That is an excuse in disguise. You are just trying to pretty up the fact that you're really not willing to do everything that God has asked you to do. Oh, I knew I didn't give it about two people clapping on that one. Let me repeat that one more time. All that is is basically you pretty up the fact that you don't really want to do everything that God has called you to do. So you pull out a limitation and say, God, look at this problem. I can't do this. I got to walk away. Let me tell you some excuses in this guy's. Now, I'm going to get to point number four, how all this changes. We've talked about a lot of bad. We've talked about all these limitations. We've talked about a path to a purpose. It's all good stuff, but it shows kind of bad twist on Moses' life. I want to show you something about your faults today. And here's what I want to dive in because here's where we are. Moses had three major faults. Three that happened in his life. Three big ones that he could not Get over, he thought. And here's the issue, and I think why Moses encapsulates his story so perfectly. Get this. Each of the faults was in a different way to his life. Here's where we are today. Some of us had faults happen to us that was not our fault. Some of us had things happen that we had no control yeah. over. And yet we hang on to that. Instead of looking to God. Moses did this, number one. What do you think about this? Moses had a fault that he was born with. I didn't, you don't have to write this down. You write on the back. There's a sermon that's placed in the back. You want to write this down. Moses was born with a fault. He was born with speech and a stutter that he could not control. A fault. Now, you say, well, that's not a fault. We're all worried. I understand. But it was to Moses what he perceived as a fault as to why he could not serve God. He was born with it. And he's saying, God, I've got the fault. It's in my stars. It's in my DNA. It's just who I am. I've got this issue. And I was born with it. Therefore, I can't be everything you want me to be. Number two, he had a fault that he was not only born with, he had one he was given. Moses was raised after he was weaned without his parents and all his family. Imagine today if somebody came and took your kids and took them off somewhere and raised them somewhere else. While you may know where they're at, your kid's going to grow up all this life wondering why the family unit and why everything was kind of shattered. He was given a fault that he had no control over after he was born. 
Somebody else stepped in and gave him something and did something to him that caused an issue in his life for the rest of his life. He had no control over it. And I can imagine he looked up to God and said, God, that's another fault of mine. Then there was a third one. And it was a fault that Moses created when he went and murdered the man on the other side of the desert and had to run and flee and hide. Some of us this morning, right as I said that, it hits you. Your biggest obstacle to overcome may not be something you're born with. It may not be something somebody else did to you. It may be something that you've created yourself. And the reason why Moses encapsulates this story so wonderfully all of his faults came from all three levels. Yeah. Moses was a flawed man with a lot of issues. I speak that this morning because there's some of us that have been born and we think that we were born messed up. We think we were born messed up with, with too many issues and too many problems. There's some of us that were born today and after we were born, issues happened. Parents divorced and created this tension and this fracture in the home. And I got angry and I got bitter over my parents. And they created this fault inside of me. This flaw now because I battle the anger and the bitterness and the hurt and the rejection. And I constantly feel like I'm not worthy or else everything would have been better in my life growing up. And someone else has created what you view as a fault within you that you battle every day. And there's others yet who have created their own issues and their problems through their actions and through their deeds. Some of you may be battling today. Some of you may not even have a driver's license because in the past... You got a DUI by making bad choices. And today, to this very day, you battle having to get past what the legal system has done because you did make a bad choice. Some of you today battle, well, God can't use me fully because I married someone I shouldn't have or I, I cheated and committed adultery on my spouse and, and it's in the past and I understand it's forgiveness, but God can't use me because I created that flaw on my own. I don't know what, you're, what you perceive as the flaw or the fault, but come on, let's be honest. Don't we all battle something within us that says we're not worthy and good enough because of X? The devil will constantly throw that up in your face and say, you did this, therefore you're not worthy. But there's only one thing that changes the concept and the construction and the eye level of the fault that we have to Jesus. Here's what it was. In Exodus chapter number 3, Moses is on the backside of this wilderness. Keeping the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, who is the priest of Midian, in verse number 1. And he led him to the backside of the desert, and he came to the mount of God, to Horeb, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame, a fire out of the midst of a bush. And behold, the bush burned with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Now many of us know from, from biblical uh, example and from, uh, like I said, Sunday school or if you grew up in church, what had happened here was there was a, bur a bush out in the middle of this desert. And you got to realize, in the backside of these wilderness and desert, it wasn't like there was trees everywhere. There was very little out there. It was just kind of desolate. And so bushes and trees are very scarce. So all of a sudden this bush, Moses is walking by, and boom, it goes up in flames. Okay, hello? Probably scared the living daylights out of him in the first place. Just, just goes up. And Moses is like, what is going on? And the angel calls out to him out of the midst of it. And the bush, as he looked, it was on fire and it kept burning and burning and burning. But what can it I mean, you throw something in fire, throw a limb in a fire and watch how fast the leaves shrivel and everything just kind of starts to timber. He's watching this burn and he's sitting there looking at it, looking at it, and nothing happened. Just fire everywhere all over it and not a leaf is burning, nothing. And the Bible says this as he's sitting there looking at this bush. Moses said, I, I'm going to turn aside and see this great sight. Why did the bush burn? That's just old country language. It's just not the way it says in the Bible. And when the Lord saw that he turned to see, 
Sometimes it just takes our eye level getting off where we think we want it and getting it where it should be. When God saw that Moses changed where he was looking, that's basically what it's saying. When God saw Moses quit looking at the wrong things and started looking at the right thing, here's what happened. God called to him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here am I. And the Lord said, draw not, put off thy shoes from your feet. For the place where you stand is holy ground. When Moses got his eyes off the desert, his situations, his surroundings, his fault, his flaws, and he looked to the fire of God. That's important. We're going to go somewhere in a second with that. When he got his eyes off of everything around him and got his eyes on the fire of God, God was then able to speak directly to Moses. And here's what's amazing. He didn't start addressing Moses' issues at the moment. He actually said, Moses, the first most important thing is take your shoes off. This place is holy. Worship. Worship. Get your shoes off. This is holy ground. Start worshiping me for who I am. And when Moses got his eyes off of where he was and got his eyes on Jesus, here's what happens. He's by himself out on a desert. He's by himself in a wilderness. And all of a sudden, he gets his eyes where it has to be. And when he walks away, he walks away with a purpose and a vision and in a place where God said, here is what you are to do. Go read all of Exodus 3. He doesn't leave that spot until he has a plan on exactly of what God has for his life. And then he starts to execute it in spite of his flaws. Here's what happens. Number four, private time. Private time with God increases boldness. Here's a murderer who gets with God and then walks right back up to the palace, up to Pharaoh, and says, let my people go after 400 years. When you get alone with God and get your eyes to a different level. See, here's the thing. I want you to look at the person next to you and say, God wants me to look at a different level. Look at the person next to you and tell them, God wants me on a different level today. God, I want your eyesight to change from down here of where we are in humanity to up here where God is. And when that happens, here's how you'll see it. By the power of God through His Holy Spirit, which is always done by fire, as we see in Acts chapter number 2. When the fire falls, it starts to burn, and the Holy Spirit becomes evident in your life. And you get private time and get alone with God and say, God... Get my eyes off of down here and get them up here. All of a sudden, you'll get boldness in your life like never before. You'll say, oh, Jesus, yes, he's the best thing that ever happened to me. Hey, friend, you want to know what will change your life? Look to Jesus. And he walked away, not only delivering himself through the power of God, but taking an entire nation with him because he got close to the fire and got the spirit of God in his life. Come on, help me out a little bit. He got the spirit of God in his life and he got the fire and changed everything about him. And all of a sudden, Moses goes from this murdering, stuttering, stammering man with all these faults and problems out on the backside of a desert by himself to walking up to the Pharaoh's palace and saying, let my people go. What boldness. A murderer who should have been tried and convicted and hanged, and he walks in, and Pharaoh never mentions it. Because when you have boldness, let me tell you right now, when you get the power of God in your life, and you get boldness, the world has nothing that they can throw at you that's going to ever stick. Because God will change the hearts and minds of those around you. Think about it today. Think about this, church. You know, band, you can make your way up. Just play some music for me if you don't mind. Think about it this morning, church. Imagine if we all got full of boldness. A boldness so great that we're willing to walk up to anyone at any time and tell them what God has said to you. Imagine Diddy having the boldness to go to our best friend. 
Imagine Grant having the boldness to go to that family member. Imagine Jordan having the boldness to go to that guy at work and say, here's the thing. I've got my eyes on Jesus. You don't understand how much he can change your life. And not be scared that they're going to be like, you are the holy road with funny people. See, isn't that what we do? What happens? Here's why. Here's the problem. All of a sudden, we've started putting an excuse in disguise. And it's just letting us know one thing. When we drop boldness, it lets us know one thing. we got our eyes off the bush. I can imagine every time Moses walked through the halls and his heart started racing. He's like, God, are you sure that I can, I can do this? I, I don't know right now. God took his mind back to, I, I spoke to you, son. I spoke to you out of that bush. I didn't let that happen for no reason. I didn't let that preacher preach on a Sunday morning in September in North Carolina about your faults not being greater than my grace. I didn't let that happen for no reason. You go tell them how good I've been to you. You go tell them you're forgiven. That's the old me. Here's the new me. It's because I got my eyes on Jesus. See, the power of this story isn't about Moses' faults. It's not about Moses' flaws. Although they're great and it's easy to sit and, and say, God, I just want to isolate myself and get away from everybody and just grown within myself, it's easy to do that. But God is saying, no, get your eyes on me and I'm going to take you in front of the world. There's somebody for you to speak to because it's going to provide life to someone else. So this morning I ask you, are you always scared to be what God wants you to be? Are you scared that what you've done stops you from serving God to full capacity? Are you scared if people found out your story and knew the real you, they'd walk away from you and leave you hanging out to dry? I want to tell you something as a church real quick. I'll tell you something as a church. It does not matter who walks through the doors of these church or what they have done. If Jesus can forgive them, he's forgiven you, he can forgive them. They are welcome here. They will always have my arms to go around their neck and hug them and say two words, welcome home. Right. The greatest, the greatest realization in the world is this. I want you to write these down in your conclusion and we'll say one thing and I'm going to do it. You've probably heard this statement before, but if you really think about it, it's powerful. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. See, Moses' life, if you look at it, that wouldn't be the guy that God would use to deliver Israel with all those faults of murder, physical limitations. You look at him and be like, hey, that's a good guy. Deliver? Nah, not so much. But see, that's because we look at who we think is qualified to do the job. We think that their life has to be so good and such a, a perfect little level and everything just kind of on a, on, on a nice little clean sheet of how good this person is. But God doesn't care about that in our eyes. Because He doesn't call people according to our qualifications. He qualifies people according to His call. Always remember that. Number two. Here's the big key. Availability trumps ability. Availability and Trump's ability. There was probably people who could speak much better than Moses. There was probably people who had a greater knack for working with people than Moses. There was people who could control their anger much better than Moses. But God was looking at Moses saying, I'll do it. I'm available. And God said, I'm going to use you and as he stands there and looks at the bush, he says, God, I'll do whatever it is that you want me to do. Availability this morning trumps ability. You say, well, it's so hard for me to talk to someone else about Jesus. I don't even want to bring it up. I don't want, I don't want them to, to think that, that I'm one of these Christian weirdos who's always going to pump Jesus on people. I, I, I mean, we talk about our church on Facebook. If they see it, they see it. If they don't, they don't. But I'm just not going like, to bring it up. And the whole time, God's looking just, just be available to teach me, teach my name to teach my word to people. Just be available and be used what God has you to do. This morning as we stand all over the building, heads bowed, eyes closed.
think about this morning. What's your faults? Where do you have issues? What do you struggle with? And think about God speaking to you in spite of those issues. Because if Romans 8, 28 is true, God has allowed you to go through something to bring Him glory. And it may be bad. You can look at it and be like, no, it was sin. It was the wrong thing. Maybe true. But God's going to use it. The day, I don't want everybody to listen to this. You can your head back, but I want you to listen. The day you will be willing to open up and tell your story of who you were, what God did, where you are now will be the day you realize the boldness that God has already given you. When you open up of where you were, you say, but if people knew where I was, if they knew some of the stories, they would never say hello. They would walk away. I would be an outcast in the church. A thousand times ago, God's grace is bigger than us this morning. And although I was a preacher's kid raised in a preacher's home, I had the same nature and I still have the same sin nature in this physical fleshly body of mine that you have. And I'm only made right through Jesus just like you. When you get to know your story and you're available to tell it. Here's who I was. Here's where I am. Here's what God's done for me. Then you can start looking past the faults in your stars and say, you know what? It's not just destined for me to be that way for no reason. God let all things work together for good because I am His masterpiece created the exact way He wanted me. I want to pray this morning as we just play. Here's what I want to do. This morning I'm going to open up the altars. I want people to come down. Listen, if you're battling something, if you're struggling, I want my wife to come up here and say, stand here. Ray and Karen, if y'all can, just come on up here. Greg, Melissa, come on over here. Here's what I want to do. I've got some people who are loving Jesus this morning and will love you. Standing down here and all they want to do is put an arm around you. Tell you, I love you. Welcome home. I'm praying over anything that you need. God has a plan for your life. I'm going to pray and the altars are open. Make your way forward. Lord, I love you this morning. There's somebody here battling right now. It's that struggle inside hitting them and saying, but if people only knew, but if people only knew, your problems are bigger than you. Your problems are taking you down. Your problems are going to ruin you. Your problems are going to wreck you. Because they're battling that right now. God, I pray that your peace. God, let the bush just light up in front of them and speak to them and say, start worshiping me. And I can take you through this. Recognize who I am. May they see that in this moment as the music plays. It's in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. As the music plays, our heads are bowed. I want you praying for people right now. There are people who are going to get deliverance. Right now, step forward. You say, well, I just need a little bit more boldness. Ready? If you need Jesus at all in your life to help you, step forward to the altar right now. Ask one of these men or one of these women to pray over your life at this moment. Come on, church. Come on. Get some help this morning. Look to Jesus.
put everything about who Jesus is and worship around the feet of Jesus this week. I challenge you every day. And as you do, your boldness for God will increase as they're down about it. The other thing I want you to realize is this. Once Moses got to this place, he goes back. And God said, I got your brother Aaron. He's going to help you. Isn't it amazing we got close to Jesus and God started making a difference in his life? He automatically put him in community with other people. So I want you to go back to your people. Go back to the people that you know. I want to have helpers for you. I'm going to put you back in a community that's going to work with you. We spoke last week about our small groups. They're so important and vital for you to connect into community of the local church with people. Listen. We've got four groups, two of them are basically maxed out, but I've got two more that have a few more spaces. They're here in Morganton. I want us, before we leave today, they're going to be set up in the back, right beside the exit doors. There's, there's the sheets there that you go put on your refrigerator to go and have community just six times between now and Thanksgiving. It's not a huge commitment, but it's going to be a start for you to start being around other people, speaking life and good things into you. I want you to sign up, become part of a group. The sign-ups will be out there at the table. Let the workers know that you want to be in their group. There's two groups with openings still. The dates are there. It has the times. Everything is there. Tonight, my group, the one I'm leading, we start for the first time at 6 o'clock. And I'm super stoked and excited to, to be starting it. And I hope if you're part of it, and the groups you are a part of, you're excited to go learn. Let's be a church that meets outside of these walls. It speaks life into each other. Church, I love you this morning. As they play, maybe sing a first or just a chorus or whatever, I will be back at the front. I love you this morning. I want to hug your neck as you walk out. I love you. I'll see you next Sunday morning, 1045. It's going to be something next week. By the way, let me talk about this for a second. I want to give you about 